much. And thank you everyone for being here today and giving us either your afternoon break or your lunch, wherever you're joining from. We're very excited to have you for today's conversation. So I am Jenny Stoikovich. I'm the founder of VWS. We're a global media and events platform that is focused on the future of food, fashion, beauty, and biotechnology, all things animal-free innovation and empowering women change makers. I have two such incredible women change makers that are here today. Uh, people I'm glad to call them both my friends and VWS mm -hmm. community members. So um, I will introduce each of them and then we will uh, take a moment for you both to talk a little bit about who you are and what you do. So first off, um, Stephanie Dorsey is joining from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, e so she is with the firm E Squared JDJ. You got it. <laughs> awesome. And we have Lisa Ferrier who is joining from Boulder, Colorado with a stray dog capital. So you have two of the leading women that are building the future of food here with you. You may not have heard of some of these firms yet, but I promise you very, very huge things to come. So um, Stephanie, how about we start with you? Let's uh, introduce yourself and, and what you do. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me here, Jen and, and Diana. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm originally from California. Did a lot of work in the food and ag startup space while I was at Harvard Law School. And then after that, took a detour, uh, had some experience in the legal space. And after that, launched my firm. Um, and what we're focused on is sustainable food and ag tech and science. And so that means that we look through the body chain from production to consumption, everything from crop efficiency technologies, alternative proteins, to also biomaterials as well. Um, we've made seven investments and we're looking for the best entrepreneurs that we can partner with and really add value. Um, so I'll pause there, but that's a little bit about us. Amazing. And Lisa. Stephanie, I just realized that I asked you where you were, and it literally says New Orleans behind your head. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Listen, it is a it is a no bones day. Um, so I I that's I'm gonna go with that excuse because you very patiently told me where you were at, and now I just noticed it's literally right there. Oh, no, no. Well, well, Lisa's <laughs> in the stray dog office, as you can see. <laughs> yes, clearly, clearly. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Feria. I am the managing partner for Stray Dog Capital, and we're an early stage food, food technology, biotechnology, cell agriculture, and precision fermentation venture capital fund. And similar to Stephanie, we actually um, are co-investors and colleagues. We invest in the food and food tech space uh, because we want to upgrade and change and improve the food system. We are on our third fund. We've been around for a while and so have made over 47 investments and counting. So we are very passionate and very into this space and have been for a while. So I'm really excited to be here and thank you for inviting us today. Lisa, can you name drop a couple of those investments, ones that some of the sure. uh, attendees might know? Yeah, sure. I think the most uh, familiar everybody's gonna be is Beyond Meat. We have Me Up With Kitchen, Kite Hill, uh, Memphis Meats in the cellular agriculture space, Gel Tour, et cetera. Awesome. Okay. So um, for folks, I see there's the Q&A is already starting to fill in. Um, I believe we have a good chunk of time at the very end for Q&A. So if you have questions throughout today's conversation, please drop them down there and we will get to as many of them as possible. Um, Lisa, I think it would be really great if we could define really quickly cellular agriculture and precision fermentation. So you mentioned that and some of the folks here perhaps know the plant-based space, but not those two areas. Yeah, sure. Actually, so I will definitely explain what it is, but I don't know. Am I allowed to share a video? I have like a really handy video. Uh, Diana, do you know? Do we have, you've got, you have share screen privileges. So All right. well, let me, let me give it a shot. Um, so for those of you who are fans of the show Westworld, this is a video. I am a Ooh. very big fan of Westworld and they show the future slaughterhouse and this character works out this future slaughterhouse. And it is not exactly what cellular agriculture is going to end up looking like, but it's a really interesting depiction of it. So let me share that with you all. Let me know if you can see that. Oh, we yeah? can. You got it. All right. Okay. So the idea behind cellular agriculture is to provide the meat that um, many people love and eat, but provide it without the animal involved, because it's a very inefficient way to eat um, meat because you have to grow the entire animal, you're growing fur, you're growing eyeballs, you're growing all kinds of stuff that we necessarily don't eat and don't really grow the animal for. 
for just a few cuts of meat. So the idea behind cell agriculture is that what is meat if not if if not cells and muscle tissue and fat and you can grow that outside the animal. So there's over 150 companies worldwide working on this technology and working on in the future being able to provide all kinds of different cuts of meat and different types of meat, basically indistinguishable from what you find today, but made in a much more um, sustainability focused and have a much smaller uh, footprint on our climate than our current system does. So folks, you probably would know the term lab-grown meat. I think that that might be what you've seen in the in the media. So that is exactly there what exactly what the cell-based and cellular agriculture that Lisa's referring to. Um, Lisa, do you mind just also adding precision fermentation? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So there's all kinds of different technologies or different products around the world that are made with precision fermentation, but really. The whole idea behind it is, you know, how do you, for example, how do you make beer, right? There's a lot of, of different entities and yeast and you're growing all kinds of different organisms under specific conditions in order to have a product that at the end you, that the product that is at the end is what you're looking for. And so it's really using food technology and biotechnology and using different tools within that space to help you either make food faster or make food or use different organisms out there to help you accelerate the production of food. And precision fermentation is already available at grocery stores in the United States right yeah. now. So if anyone has had the chance to see Brave Robot at the store, it's available mm -hmm. in most national retailers. That is a precision fermentation product. So that means that everything that Stephanie and Lisa are sharing today it's not theoretical, it's real, it's happening, and some of it's for sale now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, reminder everyone, Q&A tab, that's where you put all of your questions. Stephanie, let's start with you. I know that the, the folks that like at Northeastern love to hear a little bit about why vegan and um, what that journey has looked like. So would you mind sharing about your journey first? And then we'll go to you, Lisa. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really, it was sort of awakening that I think every um, vegan has. And, and for me, you know, thinking about food, and I think a lot of it was around health. But then as you sort of go deeper into the health implications and knowing that, you know, diet is the main driver of chronic disease, you go into the deeper question of why that is and really thinking about the food system itself and how it's really engineered to sort of market and produce and, and distribute some of the worst foods. And then you think about, well, why am I eating this? And, and sort of how sort of tradition propels you to eat foods that you, you know, ordinarily, if you need your protein, you can just sort of have your fruits and vegetables, but, you know, society tells you that you need meat. Um, and so you really think about sort of underlying why you're eating the foods that you're eating. And so for me, it was sort of a few years ago, just really going through that journey, started off as a vegetarian, sort of weeded out, you know, uh, seafood after that. Uh, it really got deeper into the space and learned more, not just about the health implications, but the planetary implications as well. Um, and really seeing that, you know, thinking about not only food itself, but how it's grown and that, you know, for agriculture itself, it could be so destructive to the planet, but it could also be regenerative and help restore the planet to where um, it could be if we, you know, sort of get off the path of where we're going now. Um, so I would say it was just sort of deeper learning and sort of once you see it and and learn and, and read the things that are out there in the world, it, it's hard to unsee it and unlearn it. And so for me, it was just a, a self-education journey. Um, and I really wanted to align, you know, what I was doing um, in my personal life with what I was doing in, you know, our professional life and really saw an opportunity um, to really invest in the space and help entrepreneurs. I always knew that I wanted to be in the food space, but I knew that I didn't want to sort of support any type of food endeavor. But one that was actually impactful and, and that I could stand behind. So that's really how I landed um, in the space. And, you know, you just learn more and more and, and see sort of some of the inequities in the system and, and all the opportunities too. Um, and that's what drives me is sort of the optimism because there are just so many untapped opportunities and it's such a, you know, underinvested area that there's just so much room for growth to really change um, the system and also make it better for, you know, humans and life on earth and the planet as well. Very timely considering business and media is the name of today's discussion. And, you know, media has had such a huge part in playing this plant-based shift. And so it sounds like it, it had a big focus um, for you and how you were educated in these last few years. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, documentary sometimes get a lot of flack for being sensational. 
Um, but a lot of the times that, you know, the, the facts are there and they're controversial, but, you know, the facts are the facts. And so it's really about being confronted with the truth um, and whether you want to take action or sort of bury your head in the sand and, you know, try to make it seem like it's not there. But for me, it's sometimes it's a self-discovery process. So I, when I originally saw the documentaries, I tried to go vegan, didn't last. It's definitely sort of an evolution process, but you could really get there with the right education and taking action as well. Last follow-up question, then I'll go to you, Lisa. Uh, do you have a couple documentaries you're gonna plug real quick right now for folks that are interested? Yeah, I mean, I think my favorite so far and it's recent is Seaspiracy. I think that one, um, I think I had the most sort of visceral reaction to because it uncovered a lot of facts that I actually didn't know before, even just being in the space for so long, uh, particularly with life in the sea. So I think if anyone hasn't seen that, they should, and they'll probably never wanna eat seafood again, but they could eat good catch, so. They have options. <laughs> Which is a good uh, segue to you, Lisa. I think good catch in your portfolio? Yes, it is. The Gethard Food Good Catch is in our portfolio. We have a few other plant based seafood companies in there as well. And oh, my journey is actually very similar to Stephanie's. I, um, I, my video or my documentary was Meet Your Meat. Um, and it really was, uh, this was produced by PETA. And when I saw it, it was really about how we've gone from in a, you know, very much an agrarian individual family farm system to feed the population into these really highly concentrated, terrible industrial systems that don't um, include, consider, or take animal um, suffering into account. It's really all about widgets and they're, all the animals are widgets and how can we squeeze more of them into one space and how can we get away with the most. And so... I saw that and I, it really disturbed me that animals were treated that way because I've always considered myself an animal lover. And, and so I, I was like, oh, this can't be right. Pete, I must have found the one terrible slaughterhouse in some place in the world, you know, but the information is out there. So if you start exploring it, you'll find the truth. It's just have to be brave enough to be able to see it and then brave enough to take some steps to decrease your own impact towards it. And so immediately for me, I became vegetarian. Vegan became it came later because it definitely was tougher for me in, in different in different channels like cheese and whatnot. Now with the addition and the inclusion of plant-based cheeses, uh, the transition is easier. But when I became vegan uh, a long time ago, it wasn't as as uh, available. And then the other piece that was really impactful to me was the fact that um, this was going to happen during my generation and. Maybe my, you know, when I, before I die, maybe I won't see the worst of the worst of it, but my kids will, and my grandkids absolutely will be involved in this and be in a world where water is scarce and resources are scarce and climate change has really overtaken everything. And so I decided that my focus and the rest of my life was going to be spent doing something about it and putting my time and my talents, uh, whatever they may be towards doing something about it and making this better. Um, I used to share the story with uh, the Matrix, thinking the blue pill versus the red pill, but I realized that a lot of Gen Z's has never seen the Matrix. So if you've seen the Matrix, I took the pill, I woke up with the robots, you know, the whole thing. If you haven't seen the Matrix, then you get, you get the point anyway. And then in well, terms okay, of documentary, new one. <laughs> yeah, Fork, Silver Knives is a must have, like that's what my husband became vegan because of that movie, more of the health aspects of eating so much animal-based products versus not. Um, so that was a big one for me. I love Cowspiracy and Seaspiracy. Both of those are really good. I will also just do a quick plug and then we'll get to the next question. Game Changers. Um, Game Changers is a phenomenal new documentary. Really well, good not new anymore, I guess, right? It's a few years ago now, but um, it's a really good deep dive into fitness, athletics, and health, um, especially for, for anyone in here that is an athlete right now. That would be the one I would recommend. Okay, so Stephanie, let's go back to you. Um, it's been a wild last few years in the plant-based space in the future of food. Could you establish for everybody, you know, what it's looked like in the last few years and what kinds of growth you've been seeing um, right now and, and in the coming years for plant-based and beyond? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think it's surprising to see sort of 2020 the shift. Um, and I think a lot of that was brought on by, you know, climate change, the pandemic and knowledge and, and sort of awareness of the growing population. Um, so I think for climate change, I think a lot of folks really started seeing the interconnectedness between 
food systems and health and the environment. Um, and really not wanting to sort of have their purchases align with the destruction of the environment and seeing how resource efficient, you know, plant-based foods are. And even when you think about fermentation, it's just a fascinating area because, you know, microbes um, are just so, you know, there are trillions of species. We only know about a few of them. Um, and when you think about it, it takes years to grow animals, years or months to grow plants, but microbes could double their biomass in a matter of hours. Um, and they make great proteins and they do it quickly um, and they require very inexpensive feedstock to do that. So it's basing, you know, sort of foods off of resource efficient mechanisms um, that I think really started coming to the forefront. And I think with the pandemic, you know, just awareness of foodborne illnesses and the issues around antibiotic resistance really came to the forefront. Um, and then also just sort of supply chain issues and really having transparency around where the food is coming from and sort of, you know, how long and sort of drawn out these supply chains are, and it's still evolving and playing out today. Um, so I really think awareness around for consumers, what was happening and also how the food is being produced um, really drove a lot of demand and because that's what drives the markets, it's consumers. And so I think the media played a huge role too in bringing awareness, um, but ultimately those consumers really drove that demand. And now you see a lot of plant-based companies are really just sort of blooming um, from plant-based to fermentation to cell ag. So I think it's it was really driven by consumer awareness and I think it's only growing, um, but also technology too and really seeing advancements in technology. Um, when you think about AI and machine learning algorithms that have been more advanced than we've ever seen before um, in biotech, the lower cost now of you know, cell production um, and also thinking of quantum computing and you know, genetic sequencing, all of this really just driving so much innovation um, so that you're seeing there are more just sort of deep tech plays in the food space, which you really haven't seen before. Um, so it's just sort of a, a full range from the consumer technology to entrepreneurs that are just creating amazing solutions. Lisa, what are you seeing? I think now would be a good time to, we can kind of just open it up for a back and forth. There's a lot to dig into here. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a few data points that come to mind. Um, so the number one leading cause of death with most what they call developed nations um, is what we eat, is chronic diseases that are causing, that are caused by what we feed ourselves. And a lot of that is driven by overconsumption of animal products. Um, having, you know, having so much animal products and animal proteins and animal inputs into our diet is not healthy. And in general, there's been a, I mean, worldwide desire to improve our collective health. One of the top three Google searches of all time is how do I lose weight? And it's about how do I get healthier, right? Those two aspects really drive people. And so in consumers in all over the world are looking to be healthier and they're looking towards plants to help them get there. So you got over 65% of global consumers are already looking to eat this way. And the pandemic really accelerated that. What, what happened is that before we used to hear consumers that were interested in this space, but had no time to figure it out or didn't know how to cook, you know, plants as their main source of protein and had concerns about it. With the pandemic, outside of us uh, baking sourdough breads and taking all kinds of random hobbies, a lot of people started really making a lot of in, 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 in roads and forays into plant-based eating and meal kits went up significantly from there because people wanted to learn how to eat better, how to eat healthier. So you have population growth in the past two decades have increased by 1.5 billion people on this planet. So we've added 1.5 billion people in the last two decades alone. So you have the earth already being hyper pressured by all these human beings that we have on the planet. All of us are trying to eat better. We're trying to do better for the environment as well. And that's being driven mostly by the younger generations, millennials and Gen Zs. And so you, you would, that creates just this massive momentum. It's this massive tsunami of change that are really pushing the food system towards a different direction. And so retailers, uh, restaurants, everybody's trying to feed, um, feed all of us and really react to these, to these changes, including... Burger King announcing that they're going to now offer plant-based uh, nuggets. KFC is adding a ton of plant-based products into their menu. McDonald's has an, announced a veggie an additional veggie burger. So you, you see retailers already reacting and trying to get ahead of this because it is not a 
trend in that, you know, oh, today we wear skinny jeans, tomorrow we don't. It's really more about a worldwide desire to eat healthier and not completely kill the environment while doing it. We did a BWS conversation in July where we brought Instacart and Deliveroo, which are, you know, the leading grocery and food delivery platforms, both over in Europe as well as in North America. And the results are staggering. You know, one third of Instacart orders has a plant-based product in the order. Um, and up to 50% of delivery orders as well have a plant-based product. And so it's growing. It's growing really, really quick. And it's, and it's growing with non-vegans, with people that are trying to dip their toes in it. Um, I think that's probably what the meal kit uh, phenomenon must have been related to, people that were trying to learn. Oh yeah, definitely. So, okay, going from there. So now we're establishing plant-based is here right? Future of food is here. It's happening. What needs to happen in these next few years from a business perspective to actually let this soar and take off? Because you mentioned, Stephanie, um, supply chain issues, right? There is a, there was a shortage of, of food that was happening in the pandemic, particularly outside of, of the U.S. If you look at places like Singapore, you know, 95% of their food was brought in to, to these islands. So they had very, very serious food issues. So what, what are we kind of facing in these next few years in this industry? We'll start with you, Stephanie, um, that we need to make happen and get right to keep this going. Yeah, I think, you know, the supply chain management is key. And I think sort of a lot of it is kind of out of entrepreneurs' hands because the current infrastructure that we have is optimized for, you know, meat production and processing and distribution. Um, so really finding companies that could either add on to those existing facilities or what they can do is create their own, um, which is a feat in itself, but sometimes necessary to really get to scale um, and do so in a predictable way. Um, and then I also think just, you know, understanding consumers, because what you want to do is once you make those products, you need to sort of have that velocity and, and sell it and get it off the shelf. And so really understanding consumers, what they want, having, you know, continual R&D and innovation around those products and making sure that they're getting the taste, the texture, the price, and, and really the convenience of the product right, um, so that they actually maintain that consumer confidence and are really able to generate those sales to be profitable. That brings me to the, remember the Beyond Burger shortage of, what was it, 17, 18, 2018? And, and so there, there really was supply chain issues, and that was a very severe uh, shortage that we had, and that related to pea protein. So you know, Lisa, having done this for several years and invested in so many companies, what are some of the challenges that you've seen and, and what do you predict is going to continue to be a challenge? Yeah, you know, when I look back at our, our first fund and the climate that we were investing in, at that point, we were all desperate for more investment into the space because there were so few investors and so many great ideas and great companies that wanted to bring amazing products to the market. But didn't have enough capital to do so or do so quickly. What now, if we fast forward to now, there's a lot of interested party in investment dollars, particularly in later stage food. And there's been an acceleration of these products getting to market and even becoming public or getting acquired quicker. So the whole private marketplace is moving pretty quickly. And I'm very satisfied to see that because you need these amazing innovative products in the consumer's hands in order to drive the change that we're trying to drive. So I think from an investment, private investment standpoint, we continue to move in the right direction. I think what we need to do are a few things. It's good that the private market is, is pretty good in terms of finding, you know, having capital to invest in entrepreneurs, but we need to continue to have those entrepreneurs innovate in all kinds of different directions. You know, I was uh, talking to someone the other day and they were saying, well, you know, you don't, we don't need any more burgers. Like you guys are done, <laughs> plant-based investing. And I said, okay, great. Can we go eat a great plant-based lobster? Where can I find that? No, yes. no plant-based lobster. <laughs> That's great. There's yeah. so many categories that don't have fabulous replacements yet. I mean, most of them. Yeah, the burger area, even though I would say that there's still an opportunity for clean label, additional clean label companies. But yeah, burgers and milk, they, they're looking pretty good, pretty solid. There's nothing but opportunity in a lot of other categories that don't have competition. So additional entrepreneurship, putting forward amazing products in these categories, starting to populate all these other products that we normally eat, but don't really have a great plant-based alternative is going to be a very important one. Um, 
public investment in different categories, particularly cellular agriculture in the next five years is gonna be critical. Cellular agriculture is incredibly interesting, very promising, could be game changing, but there's still in early stages in development because it is very complicated to do. Now, one of the great things about cell um, agriculture is that the medical field, because of organ transplant and um, all kinds of different transplant, is already has already been working on this space for a while. We'll continue to work on this space. You know, you probably all have heard this whole thing about if you're a burn victim, they can take some cells from your body and actually, you know, put an implant of skin that is your skin that they've grown somewhere else, and then they put it on you, and your body uh, accepted more red readily than somebody else's. Um, transplant. And so their medical field is already helping this category, but public, i.e. governmental support in the research and development is going to be key to help us accelerate this more. Um, and then the third piece that I would say is, you know, nonprofits continue to help us move and push, you know, uh, the whole category forward because there's so many different, again, block and tackling policies that are happening. Um, it, the labeling laws are a situation where you know, a couple of different states have tried to pass legislation so that you can't call plant-based milk milk because it needs to come from the memory gland of a cow, if you can believe that. And they wanted to pass, you know, pass legislation regarding that. And there's been all kinds of nonprofits finding that. And so really continuing to grow the breadth of different entities that are working towards moving things forward from entrepreneurs to venture capitalists to government to nonprofits. And really growing those partnerships is going to be essential enough because we're going to get there. It's just this is going to get us there quicker and we really need to get there quicker. There's so much to unpack there. First thing I'm going to like put on the table um, to both y'all ladies. Okay, what categories do we need? There's, there's got to be tons. And I imagine there's some would-be entrepreneurs and, and engineers too in here that have the, uh, the important skills needed to start building these categories. Yeah, I would say more biomaterials as well. I think, you know, the meat space, I think plant-based is now 2.5% of the market. So there's so much room for growth there. And I completely agree with Lisa around, you know, opportunities for clean label, nutritious, functional foods in that category. Um, but I also think, you know, outside of food, when you think about materials, um, really thinking about, you know, alternative leather, cotton, nylon, et cetera, there's just so much that it could be applied to. Um, particularly with leather, where we could take animals out of the equation. I think materials and textiles are an area that, that represents a huge amount of growth and opportunity. And it's yeah. related too. Right, definitely. I, I think in the food space, I mean, so many different categories, I'm particularly passionate about seafood in general. Anything that comes from the ocean, we need to have great alternatives for. Um, we continue to have amazing products, but at a higher price. So getting to a yeah. place where from an ingredient or cost standpoint, we can get these products into the market at a lower price than the incumbent products is going to be incredibly helpful. Um, I think that there's an opportunity for more ethnic and representative foods out there um, and, and in general to be able to serve more parts of the world and more parts of our own, own country. Um, as well as different protein inputs, you know, almost all the companies that we talk to are, you know, wheat or pea or soy based, and there's so many other plant based proteins that I'm really excited about. Um, and the other one that I would add that I'm really excited about, and, and Jennifer, I know for the, for VVS that we're going to talk to this company, but the other day, uh, this company sent us samples of a plant-based drumstick, like literally a chicken drumstick, mm -hmm. but it's all plant-based, but it has a structure. And I've tried a few other companies that are attempting to do wings and drumsticks and steak and all kinds of different really exciting products. I think that those categories also have a lot of opportunity because it's great to have burgers and all that space, but what about textured products? What about things yeah. that have more structure? I think that's also a very interesting space. Yeah. And that's the real challenge, right? You know, it's one thing if you can coat something and make a nugget because a nugget's already a processed, spicy coated product, but the chicken breast, where is the chicken breast? Where is the lobster tail? Exactly. Exactly. And we, you know, we, we want to be a plus, 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 right? We want to be a no sacrifices here. It's going to be better for the environment, better obviously for the animals, better for your health, but no sacrifices in terms of the textural sensorial experience that you want to experience. Uh, no sacrifices at the Thanksgiving table, right? And like we really want to help 
these entrepreneurs bring products to the market that will thrill us and not kill us, right? So it really has to be a plus, plus, plus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and this really gets into the, the next question that I'm gonna have. And just a reminder to folks, I see the Q&A is like pop in now. So just keep sticking those questions in there and, and hopefully we'll get to lots of them. So we talked about access to food and that's something that you started from um, Stephanie in the beginning and your remarks, price is, is a thing right now, right? It is still very expensive to have a lot of these same foods that you're used to eating for perhaps $3.99 from Tyson all of a sudden is $6.99 if you're getting one of these other brands. And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about at VWS a lot is how are we going to build a diverse and equitable future of food? So how do we make sure that we are including all these communities? Um, Stephanie, in terms of in the South, like how is the, the plant-based adoption there? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, I think in the South, uh, particularly New Orleans, we have around 10 vegan restaurants here, um, but I don't think it's sort of as widespread as I would like. I think yeah. in other areas like Atlanta, it might be a little different, um, but I would say, you know, price is, is definitely a pain point. And I think, you know, just stepping back or away from sort of plant-based products, when you think about transitioning to a plant-based diet, there are other ways to sort of do that. And maybe you can do it through whole food, plant-based ingredients, um, creating our own foods, and that could be less costly than buying sort of um, the foods that are already prepared. So I would say that's a good way to start. Um, but it, you know, at the end of the day, we want it to be inclusive because that's the way to have the most impact. And so um, the hope and the goal is that these companies, as they scale, the prices will go down, and that's what you're seeing with Beyond Meat and Impossible. Um, so really, it's it's hoping that those more mature, larger companies could bring that price down, and the other companies that are emerging can follow suit. Um, so that's really the hope there. But I think, you know, a lot of innovation will help bring down the prices too. Um, as Lisa was talking about, you know, finding companies that are really creating novel products. So different types of products using different ge geographical plays, also novel ingredients, sometimes using AI to drive the formulation and design of those products um, to really get that sensory fill and, and really replicate the experience of eating the animal analog. Um, so I think really using technology to find ingredients that may not be as expensive could ultimately drive down the cost too to make it a more sort of mass market product um, because that's the ultimate goal is to, to not only have it for the vegans and vegetarians, but also um, the mass market everyday consumer as well. I think this is actually a good time to, you know, you've mentioned AI a couple of times, Stephanie in particular. I think for, for folks trying to wrap their heads around how does AI work with food, Obviously, the, the applications we've seen right now have been, you know, essentially all the plant proteins that Lisa's talking about, there's thousands of them out there. And what do we eat, like three or four of them uh, in the cans at the store, right? So it's very labor intensive for humans to be able to go through and, and experiment. So AI has the capabilities of being able to develop this faster than, than a human could. What are some of the applications of AI? I know there's probably a lot of STEM folks that are listening right now. Yeah, so Lisa and I actually just invested in a company that's using AI um, to drive the formulation of alternative eggs in Germany. Um, so that's one way, and it's really using a computational approach, um, using inputs that are publicly available, sometimes privately available, and really drawing from those databases ingredients that will really mimic on a molecular level the structure of an animal protein. Um, and so their first go-to-market product is an egg. Um, and what we've seen is that, you know, for eggs particularly, I think there are around 20 compounds, but eight are the ones that humans actually fill and sense. And so what they're doing is targeting those eight in their product formulation. Um, so you also see that with NACO, um, and they're doing that in a vast majority of sort of SKUs. They originate from Chile, and I think they've gone to different markets um, in the sort of, you know, plant-based milk and burger markets. So I think there is just so much room um, for growth there when it comes to the type of products it could be applied to. And it essentially automates the process of R&D. So it's kind of like, you know, the car industry in the 18 or 1900s, it lacked automation. Um, and what, what, what they're doing really now is adding automation to that R&D process, which could be very labor and time intensive. Yeah, and even Journey Foods down in Austin, Texas, they're using AI in a different way. They're, you know, looking at that supply chain, that entire process from start to finish of where can we find some of those gaps and holes. And um, this is uh, this is where I'm going to take the question next for you, Lisa. But you know, looking at those traditional companies, I know Journey Foods said that a lot of them aren't using AI yet. They're not innovating yet. 
how can plant-based work with them or should they work with them? Should plant-based companies be working with meat companies? Yeah, so there are two different questions in there. I think that their AI has a ton of opportunity and companies collaborating with others who are enabling them to accelerate their R&D or whether it be externally or internally, either one works. Um, to help them, you know, continue to put out products that are superior in like, you know, kind of going back to the plus, plus, plus common that are superior, but get there, getting there quicker, cheaper, et cetera. I think it's going to be essential to grow, especially as technology continues to play a larger and larger part. It doesn't necessarily have to be a food scientist in a kitchen, you know, kind of Frankensteining things and putting a little bit more salt and a little bit less pepper and all that stuff to be able to develop great products. There's all kinds of different ways to accelerate that process. Now, in terms of the meat producers, you know, there's there's been a lot of conversation regarding, for example, Tyson's investment in Beyond Meat and Cargill and other investors invested in cell technology. And, you know, we have had conversations with both, you know, Tyson folks, Cargill folks, et cetera around what they see as the future of this space. And I, I think there's nothing more telling than that Cargill changed their overall brand to be from a meat company to a protein company. They understand that this is a space that's incredibly large that will continue to grow and that they need to either be nimble or be out of business. And so the, how they're looking at this category in general is either as a JV partner where let's say one of our companies produces you know, what they do best, which is the front end, but then, you know, a Cargill or a Tyson or another company ends up putting it in the retailer and using their own supply chain to get there and do that faster, which is the model that many companies use, Unilever, General Mills, Kellogg's, they get these startups and they plug them into this very highly tuned supply chain system, and then they help them do what they do, but more and better. And so that's how they're looking at this space. They've developed some internal products, uh, particularly Tyson that have had so, so success, that's not their strength is to develop plant-based products. And so they're looking externally to continue to partner, to continue to move away in a way from their existing um, source of business because they're, they say they're not in the business of necessarily animals, they're in the business of making money. And if they can provide protein for money in a different way, then they're open to that. So for folks that are listening that want to get involved in this space, Lisa, we'll start with you. Uh, and then Stephanie, where would you recommend people look first? Where is the white space? We've said seafood, obviously. What do we need? Yeah, so I'll say Good Food Institute is a great first step for any entrepreneur, would-be entrepreneur who's interested in this space. They have incredible toolkits, uh, pitch that they can help you on uh, develop your own pitch deck. They connect you with potential co-founders. They really do a really nice job. And it's a, a nonprofit um, focused on the food space as well. So Good Food Institute. I would start there. In terms of what to develop, there's so many different categories that don't have a fabulous product. What I recommend is that, you know, you take a look in, the, in your nearest grocery store, take a look at the products that are most popular and take a look at the, uh, the, uh, the other plant-based products that surround them, if there are any, and what are their pros and cons and can you do better? You know, I think us from a venture capital standpoint, we always look for companies that have some kind of platform solution. So it's not only one product that has been developed in somebody's kitchen and that's all they have, but really they think about a category or, you know, Stephanie mentioned NotCo as an example of a platform approach. It wasn't necessarily one product that they were trying to move, but really a whole platform set of solutions that they can provide because they have either a manufacturing competitive advantage or a formulation or AI competitive advantage, but something that really allows them to enter multiple categories. And that to me, that usually is very exciting to me as a venture capitalist is to see that approach. The moat. <laughs> yeah. Stephanie? Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, I completely agree. And I also think, you know, innovation when it comes to the business model and whether you want to approach the business from a B2B model or a B2C, um, really thinking about it from that angle and targeting the market spaces there that haven't been um, as saturated. And then technology plays, really leveraging deeper tech, um, especially with the proliferation and the advancement. I think there is a lot of opportunity there. And then also in geography, I mean, there are so many untapped markets, you know, particularly in Europe and other areas, India, 
Um, so really thinking about, you know, particular geographic plays that you could target as well um, could really present a lot of potential. Would you mind defining for folks D to C and B to B? Yeah, absolutely. So B2B is essentially, you know, you sell your products to other businesses as opposed to having a consumer facing brand. Um, and D2C is more so you're selling either via e-commerce or you're going through retailers or food service operators to sell your product. B2B companies are those ones that you hear about when they have some crazy IPO on the stock market and you go, huh, what is that? Oh, it's worth $4 billion. I've never heard of it. It's been powering all the things that you do buy. It helps them sell to you. <laughs> so I That's see some questions. It. <laughs> yeah. every, every time I go, I've never heard of this company. Okay, it's probably gonna be on the stock market in a year. <laughs> uh, okay, so I see there's some questions that are uh, flowing in. I'll uh, get to those. I think we'll do one more question and then we can start to go to the Q&A. Uh, so Stephanie, we'll start with you. If you were a business leader, right now and you were not in the food space or the plant-based space and you wanted to start taking some steps towards implementing more sustainable business practices as it pertains to food policy and beyond what what would you recommend for some of those first steps that's a great question i you know i would start at the source so really think about sourcing um, sustainable sourcing ethical sourcing and really understanding sort of the point of where you're getting your you know, ingredients, products, et cetera, um, and how that impacts the supply chain and, and really the life cycle of that product as well. Um, and then also the supply chain itself and thinking about the suppliers you're using um, and really the direct and indirect emissions of the products that you're putting out in the world um, and your business operations itself. And so, you know, are you using renewable energy? Are you, you know, yeah, just uh, sort of implementing things that could be really helpful, even if it comes to, you know, having a plant-based lunch um, in the office as opposed to, you know, ordering Domino's. Or if you order Domino's, get a Domino's with um, Beyond Meat Sausage. So really just making um, changes on the business level, on the supply level, really thinking um, critically about your sourcing and production so that you can understand the impact um, of the products that you're putting out and then being able to measure it and ultimately um, reduce those emissions and, and just the environmental impact you have. Fantastic. Um, I'm actually going to add a quick plug. The food policy that you mentioned, Stephanie, there's a, a group that I'm on the board of called Default Veg. They do really great work and they, they work with corporate clients to help them create a default vegan menu or plant forward menu for all of their different business operations. It's a really good way to kind of flip the script on things. So instead of things being default with animal products, it's actually the opposite. And we find that there's a substantial uptick in people eating plant-based options if meat has to be added or dairy has to be added. So that's also a really good resource for folks. Lisa, what about you? I don't think I have anything to add. That was a solid response from Stephanie. All right. So let's, uh, you guys want to get into a couple of questions? Let's, let's see what it. we've got here. All right, Justin. Hi, Justin. It's been a while. I saw you on Clubhouse last. Um, what slash who are some resources to connect with in an effort to support business owners of animal farms to transition into plant farms? I'll throw this to you first, Lisa, because I know that you're on the board of MFA and they're doing yep. some cool work here. That's exactly what I was going to say. So I'm on the board of for Mercy for Animals and they're doing a whole slew of work in the space called transformation, like farm transformation. And their whole idea is that uh, they, you know, work with farmers who want to shift away from animal production into plant-based production of all kinds of different products from blueberries to cannabis, honestly, all kinds of different plants. And, and they work together to help them with best practices, sometimes loans, all kinds of different, all kinds of different help and support. And, uh, and so if you're interested, take a look at that, reach out to them or reach out to me. I'd be happy to connect you as well. A few that I'll also add to that. So um, Assemblymember Ash Kalra, who is the San, San Jose representative, has been doing some really amazing legislative work and working on some policies to help move some California funding to help dairy farmers uh, be able to, to transition to plant-based protein. So 
um, really cool policy stuff that you could be looking at. Um, if you are not living in California, this might be a good opportunity for you to see if you could go to your state legislature and talk to them about a similar bill uh, being launched in your state. And then another one that I'll quickly plug is Susie Cameron, um, a good friend of ours at BWS, is also doing some really cool work down in New Zealand um, to help with the dairy farmers transitioning away uh, from dairy down there, there's a really great documentary called Milked that'll be coming out very soon that will expose this. Stephanie, any uh, any recommendations? We got you on mute again. Oh, uh, like smash the plate. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say I think you guys covered everything. Okay. All right. These are great questions, by the way, everyone. You have got the people that this is what we. Uh, our days are just immersed in this entire topic. So uh, specific to Lisa's point, this is from Andrea about growing depth of entities moving things forward. What can plant-based investors, entrepreneurs, and so on do to reach and influence policymakers so they truly understand and act how game-changing this is for social justice, nutrition, and climate change? Well, I just mentioned the one bill um, that you can work on, of course. Uh, any other thoughts that either of you want to add? Yeah, I think, you know, there's power in numbers. So I think any organization that you can join um, that's working on the endeavor is, you know, would be really helpful. And then also I think GFI is always um, doing things in the space, particularly on the policy end, that could be really helpful. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that there's like from the, the one, like you as an individual, there's definitely what Jennifer said, just call your legislators and just say, hey, I really am interested in this space. Can you, what are you doing about it? Can you add this, block this? You know, this is literally their job is to listen to you. So don't be afraid. As a matter of fact, I got them. I have my legislators on speed dial because I call them so often <laughs> about all kinds of different things. And so, you know, make sure that you, you, you use your right to do that. That's what's an individual. I think from there, it's like, how do you influence your different circles and how do you get involved in the different circles? So number one, how do you make sure you and your family are leveraging your legislators, right? Number two, how do you influence your community, your work area, your local school, to add, um, you know, more plant-based options. I mean, when my kids started kindergarten, I was horrified at what foods that were feeding these kids. And forget about vegan or not vegan. Like it was just junk every single day. It was nuggets with fries. It was pizza with, you know, all kinds of different carbs and um, really fatty, terrible things for their health. And so we've been working very hard with our local district to offer more plant-based solutions that are like actually delicious so the kids would want to eat them. So you, you can start influencing, joining different groups as, as uh, Stephanie and Jennifer both mentioned to make sure that your voice is being heard and amplified and multiplied. But don't ever think that you don't have um, enough influence or power to actually make a change because you plus your you know million other friends calling a legislator is definitely gonna get their attention. So each one of our voices is so incredibly important. Yeah, I think that that is one of the, the things that I really want to implore people is to understand that you're all part of different communities, right? You know, there's your school, as Lisa mentioned, right? There's actually your university you're in right now. So you can go, you know, speak to, to the heads of the university about the types of plant-based options they have. There's your local municipality as well. We, we mentioned state legislatures, and that can seem a little daunting because states can be pretty big and federal is even bigger. But what about the city that you live in? Um, have you gone to a city council meeting? Do you speak to some of your local um, elected folks? Because they're very, very approachable. And at the end of the day, they work for us, right? You know, they are accountable to our constituents. And so um, that's another way that we've been really successful is New York City and Berkeley and other city level um, folks have been able to pass some policies as well. Okay. So, oh, here's a good one. Marketing. Okay. We'll start with you, Stephanie. Marketing issues around meat alternatives. Do we, do we think that there is an issue with calling it meat alternatives? And I'm going to actually add something to that. Vegan versus plant-based. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, from a consumer entry point, I don't think there's a problem with, you know, using meat alternatives because ultimately, 
customers are looking for an alternative to those meat products. And so, you know, they're looking for something that mimics the taste and texture and feel of meat. Um, so it's essentially calling it what it is, but I understand that there are a lot of legal issues with that. And there's been a lot of, you know, issues around the labeling uh, that many companies have been fighting for for quite some time now. So I know it's controversial, but I think at its core, um, what it's trying to communicate is that, you know, consumers are looking for an alternative um, to those conventional animal products. And this represents that. So I think it's a pretty sort of um, literal, you know, term for what it is. Um, in terms of plant-based versus vegan, um, I think that's a huge issue only because plant-based might not necessarily mean that it's vegan. And so there could be a lot of sort of misrepresentation and misinformation there that could be um, really problematic, especially for vegans who, you know, are trying to avoid certain items and, and want that transparency from just looking at the front of the label. It's like you have to sort of turn around and see that there might be some way in there or some other animal yeah. product that you otherwise wouldn't, you know, want to have. So I think um, it should be more clear on sort of if this is plant based, is this animal free? So maybe animal free is probably the best term and, and not just sort of meat free, but animal free, animal product free um, products to make it more transparent. Okay. What do you think, Lisa? Yeah, ditto. I mean, the other day we we bought some beans and one of my kids is really labeled once I got them home. And it would, they said that they were plant-based, but they actually were not vegan. And it's, and I agree, it's so incredibly misleading and frustrating. Um, so we had a, a get together completely tangential. We had to get together with some friends and we uh, brought them a bag of beans because we are that friend group. <laughs> it's very awkward, but also fun. Yeah, this is a conversation that uh, has been heating up quite a bit. Um, there is some brands that notoriously have been using the word plant-based, very large emblazoned, as big as you possibly can see it on uh, their packaging, but they are not plant-based. Uh, if folks are interested, we uh, you can look up on YouTube, Vegan Women Summit. We did an entire talk on plant-based versus vegan um, that is available for you to watch there with Instacart and Deliveroo. Uh, it was, I believe, vegan is five times more searched than plant-based. So folks keep saying plant-based, but at the end of the day, you know, vegan through and through tends to be the search term folks use. And then even on Instacart, it was like 80 or 90% of all the searches um, said specifically vegan, not meat-free, not animal-free, not plant-based. Okay. And let's see. Oh, this is a great question. Uh, how about we'll start with you, Lisa, and then we'll go to you, Stephanie. What do you look for in a pitch? In a pitch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a few things. Um, I'll, I'll talk pitch and I think maybe also company. I think that might also be a question there. Um, in terms of a pitch, I, you know, I only do 30 minute pitches because I found it with the pandemic that I was doing 10 hours of meetings, like literally meetings a day and had no time to actually get work done and, and advance some of the initiatives that we got going on. And so I shortened them all to 30 minutes and they ended up being awesome because then we go straight to the point. Um, but one of my, I would say my pet peeves about this space um, is somebody pitching me is that they spend a lot of time telling me why this is an important area. I know it's an important area, so we invest in it. I know what's going on in the climate. I get the whole thing with the health. I believe you me that I understand it. Do not spend 20 minutes out of your 30 minutes explaining to me why these product, what this product is so necessary, how big the market is. Knowing who you're talking to is so incredibly important, okay? And I love nothing more than an entrepreneur who starts asking me questions because then they can really curate what they're going to say to me as opposed to spending a lot of time on things that I'm like, I'm not ready to know that or I already know that or whatever it is, right? So interview your venture capitalists, understand what their check size is and what their focus is, what are they concerned with? What do they, what do they think are categories that are over? Um, exposed? Like, what do you think is the categories that are underexposed? Like, just spend a good seven to 10 minutes understanding where they stand, what they're looking for, what they're excited about, and then focus your pitch on that, right? Um, so that's the first thing. And the second piece is we invest, we look for two main things um, at the top of the list, the team and what the product platform is going to be. So the team is incredibly important. I need to feel like you have a good balanced skill sets, uh, that you're going to be able to do what you're telling me you're going to do because you have the right people around the table, usually co-founders at that at the stage that we invest. And the second piece is that you have a product that's a platform. You're really thinking you might be a $1 million company or less, 
but you're thinking like a $10 billion company. You're already thinking, hey, I'm going to develop this platform. And as I staff and get capital, here's how it's going to grow. But I have something that's a sustainable competitive advantage that's going to take me from here to you know all the stages that I need to do next. I love those companies because I've had different pitch meetings that I say, okay, I know you're raising a million, but what if I give you 20? What would you do with it? And had compl entrepreneurs completely blank out, like no idea, because they're, they're only looking for today. But I, as a venture capitalist, look for the future. I'm looking five years on the road. I remember you saying that at the Vegan Women's Summit, your number one like piece of founder advice is you need to have an answer for the $10 billion check. Yeah, you need to have yeah. thought about that already. You know, yeah. um, you, you need to have thought about this company when it's already an IPO, like how big it's going to be, what it could it look like, like have that vision because that's what we're, you're enrolling all of us in. Amazing. All right, Stephanie, your quick um, tip. I realize we're almost at time. Yeah, I mean, I think Lisa covered everything. I would just add, you know, for us, team, 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 as early stage investors, that's what we're investing in. That's what we know most about at this stage. And usually sometimes you haven't proved out, you know, the concept. So we really want to know who you are, what's driving you, you know, are you really taking the steps to understand um, the product deeply, you understand your consumers, do you, you know, really have the wherewithal to get those consumers, win them, um, we want to see that you have a healthy disregard for them possible and really are just willing to move mountains to get there. So I think um, really telling your story um, and letting us sort of understand who you are as a person um, will pay dividends because ultimately we're investing in you. Well, I think that's a good mic drop. Um, I believe we are at time for all of you that joined us today for this past hour. This is this is gold, right? Like this, honestly, we covered a lot. I really hope that um, folks have a chance to, to share this recording out because there's some really, really good wisdom in here.